So I did this adaptation and I finished it and I was so excited. Like it turned out so well. It was like everything I wanted it to be. I remember just like finishing it at two in the morning and just being like, oh my God, oh, this is it. This is like, this is exactly what I want. Oh, this is fantastic. So excited, right? I turned it in um, and, you know, I showed it to some people. They were like, this is great, right? Oh my God, this is fantastic, right? Turned it in. The director basically was like, yeah, it needs a lot of work. It's like, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, just, I don't really like it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I might need to take a pass at this myself. Well, you know, like, it's just, you know. And the producer was like, basically, yeah, the director doesn't like it. I, you know, kind of, he wants to kind of go his own way with it. I, you know, we really need to get this made and well, you know, so. And I was like, wow, okay. Right. And that was, I was like, it felt like some of the best work I'd ever done. I was super excited about it. And basically like, it just landed with a thud. The, the gospel that I preach to young writers and young creatives is basically like, do your work every day like stay focused on what you are doing and care about and that that work-life balance doesn't come from like it doesn't just happen you have to decide that it's happening you have to schedule it you have to like so you know i've been on this kick where i i, I was like i'm going to work out every day of my 49th year so i went through my 49th year and I'm, i think i'm on 392 days in a row of working out but that's like a like that, again, that doesn't happen by accident. And like, if you're gonna run a show and work out every single day when you're running a show, even when you're in production, even when you're on set, even, you know, like, and that kind of spills over. Does that make sense? Oh, it and absolutely to, makes sense. So yes, and- it's, it's sort of related to the kind of things that you talk about. And, and it's something that's very important to me. And it's the biggest thing that I see for, for like young creatives is, you know, they kind of want a lottery ticket. They want to, you know, they want a, they want it to be about one thing. They want it to, you know, and it's just like, yeah, my, my basic attitude, it, it, the takeaway is this. If you want to break in, if you want to succeed, nothing works, but if you are utterly relentless and totally disciplined, something works. Oh my God. Do you have no idea how much fun we're going to have? Okay. Because fair. that's exactly the kind of stuff that we that I talk about all the time. And I knew there was a reason I wanted to have you on the show and you've been on my Trello board for like two years. I'm like, oh, well, there we gotta go. get back. When am I gonna get back? Uh, maybe not now, maybe not now. And I'm like, nope, now's the time. Nailed it. Perfect. So on that note, that is the perfect segue, as we call in the business, to uh, mm-hmm. formally introducing you. So for those that don't already know, I'm here today with Matt Nix, who is a writer, director, executive producer. You've worked on shows like Burn Notice, which I may know a thing or two about. We might be talking about a little bit. Um, the Gifted for Fox, Turner and Hooch. You're now uh, developing and working on the pilot for True Lies. Um, you've worked on a lot of stuff. And we're going to dive deep into how we can approach this if we're creative professionals that want to work with you or people like you. And more importantly, if we want to create the kind of work environments and become the the showrunner creator that you are. But before we get into that, I just want to say thank you. The fact you've taken the time to talk to me and my audience means the world to me. You are very welcome. Excited to do it. So where we're going to begin is kind of the, the origin story of how you and I met. Mm-hmm. The story of how I got the job on Burn Notice was just kind of a thing that I thought I needed to do, talking about being relentless and being disciplined and never giving up. But according to a lot of my readers and followers and my students, it's now become kind of a legend. And I've told the story several times from my perspective. I had Steve Lang on. He told his side of the story to understand how do I build relationships and get in front of the right people. But I've never actually heard your specific side of the story. And I want people to understand your side of the story because there are so many people listening that are stuck between a rock and a hard place where they know they have the skills to do it, but they don't have the credits or the experience and somebody needs to give them a shot. So walk me through to the best of your recollection, how you were first introduced to me. Well, um, basically the, the Bannon way that you had edited showed up, um, kind of in our offices 
Um, and as I recall, Steve Lang had our editor on Burn Notice, kind of the, the, the lead editor on Burn Notice. He had taken a look at it and was like, oh, hey, you should check this out. And then I forget if it went from Alfredo Barrios, who was an executive producer on the show, to Steve or from Steve to Alfredo, but it kind of came up a few times and it was sort of, I just remember it sitting on someone's desk. And, um, and then we were talking about bringing on another editor and um, basically between Steve and Alfredo, it was like, oh, you got to look at this. This guy totally gets it. It's exactly what we need. And, um, and I was like, okay, you know, it's kind of rare to see something come in with that much polish and that much, and that was sort of that specifically, it was specifically in the zone for what we needed. Um, and yeah, so I took a look at it and I, God, I, I did not watch the whole thing. I think I watched like five minutes and I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Right. Um, and I think for us, part of it was just that, um, as you well know, like on, Burn Notice, we were doing a lot of big action, but we were not, it wasn't like you had every shot you could ever imagine and you were able to cut every possible thing in, you know, like it, you really, there was a degree of, you know, you had to dive into the, the outtakes and the dumpster diving and you had to reverse the shot and you had to like figure out a weird, you know, like a stock shot you could cut to, to get out of the thing, you know, like there were all of these, there was a lot of innovation and, and like the, the big thing that I used to say to, to writers and stuff on that show is like, we are here to force this to work. Like you, there's no, like it, the answer can never be, yeah, we just didn't get it. Right. We got something right? We, we are making something. We are going to force this. We are going to torture this footage until it turns into what we need it to turn into. And sometimes that required rewriting. Sometimes that required, but a, it, it always required a lot of attention from the editors. And so that was definitely Steve's kind of approach and attitude. And it just happened that I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is highly polished, was clearly not made with an enormous budget. Um, this is a guy who knows how to torture footage until it turns into something, you know, cool. And, uh, yeah. And, I, but I'd also say just with, along with that, um, that that's not, um, that's not the sort of thing, uh, it, that was a very unusual circumstance, right? Um, and in the sense that like, we happen to be looking for an editor, uh, that we happen to have the attitude, Hey, we'd rather sort of raise an editor from, you know, a, a baby editor. We'd rather, we'd rather someone with enthusiasm and, and that kind of thing, because a lot of places wouldn't do that. Right. So I, I guess I'd say to any of your viewers, it's not that that in particular is a good way to break in because it's not like, really i have other shows like when i was on the gifted no one was ever going to break in on the gifted um in that kind of way just because it was for fox network there were a lot of producers involved ultimately any editor that we were going to hire on that show was going to have to have a ton of experience because there was so much vetting burn notice though wasn't like that and i guess i just say in general the the lesson i think to draw from your experience is like if you're really making stuff that you're super proud of and super excited about, and you're true of heart about it and you keep plugging at it at some point, something's going to break your way. There's going to be some weird experience like you had on burn notice. That's going to break your way, but it's not going to be exactly the same thing. Yeah. And I would say that uh, some of it was just this weird experience, but some of it goes back to where you started at the very beginning about just absolutely being relentless and instead of like, oh, I got lucky, I was in the right place at the right time, I created the opportunity to be in the right place at the right time because I did extensive research knowing that the Bannon way was my calling card. Where does this belong? When I actually worked on it, I hadn't even heard of Burn Notice, which is so weirdly coincidental when you look at the styles. Yeah, yeah, that's And somebody, weirdly. they're like, this looks just like Burn Notice. Like, are you ripping off Burn Notice? And I was like, 
what's burn notice? Which, by the way, great SNL sketch. Uh, We can put a link in the show notes. But I'm like, what's burn notice? Is it about firefighters or something? I'm sure you've never heard that before. Um, And then when I watched it, I'm like, are you shitting me? Like, this is my ticket. This is how I get into scripted TV because I had spent years wanting to do big features. And this was right around the time when all of the really great indie features like the searchlights and the focus features and all those were starting to slowly die. And all the really great character driven stuff was TV. I'm like, I want to make the transition to TV. You can't make the transition to television. You're just an indie feature editor. Oh, really? So I did the research, saw Burn Notice. I remember during uh, one summer vacation, my wife and I watched the first two seasons over like a week. I'm like, oh, I'm so working on this show. Like I can do this in my sleep. And I think that one of the clinchers, having uh, talked to Alfredo about this, as you said, the executive producer, he was the one that I ended up interviewing with because um, you know, you're know you Matt Nix and you've got other things to do than edit you know, or uh, meet with young editors. Um, but my goal was to go into that interview and convince him that nobody knows your show better than I do. I watched the first three seasons because I started season four. I watched the first three seasons twice. That's a lot of television. Mm -hmm. But I went in there and I'm like, listen, I remember in episode 311 where this happened at the end of act two. You have the, you know, flash to white and it goes into the sunglasses and you add grain and then you cut to black. Like you could have gotten people from the biggest network shows on TV. They wouldn't give a shit about those details. And you've probably been in that position where you get the bigger names and you're like, They don't get the show. They don't understand what we need, which I believe is ultimately what got me over the hump of I don't have the credits because I know it wasn't easy for you and or Alfredo to go to Fox and USA and be like, hey, here's this guy that's never done anything. Can he work on our show? Like, I would imagine that wasn't an easy conversation. I will say, though, that I mean, I'll tell you, the conversation for me was I watched it. I was like, okay, check him out. See if he's crazy. Like, I mean, it seems like, uh, uh, seems great. Yeah. And now that, and now that you're talking about that, I remember Alfredo walking into my office and being like, oh yeah, he's the guy we're hiring him. Right. One thing though, that, I mean, that I find interesting is how rare it is for people to really know a show backwards and forwards. Right. Um, I've actually talked to like young writers who have reached out to me at various points and, and I, I try to be, this is going to sound, well, this will sound how it sounds, but like sometimes I'll like actually coach people in the, in like in the moment when they're reaching out to me, like someone will reach out to me and I'll say like, Hey, nice to hear from you, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you about the letter that you just wrote to me and why you need to write a different kind of letter. Oh my God, you're, I do the same thing, by the way. I knew oh, there you, I, go. you and I are so much alike. So yeah, keep going. But I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so I'll just be like, okay, so you need to start a little bit more casual. It isn't blah, blah, blah. Like, this is how it works. And, you know, and I'll say, like, you should find something to say about my work in this thing, right? Blah, blah, blah. Like, and and I'll just say like, okay, so take this and go off and try again send me another email and we'll see how that goes. Right. I've also though, you know, talked to people that came in and been like, you know, and said like, basically, Hey, it's okay that you haven't seen any of my stuff. Right. But I I need to, I just want to tell you, you know, young writer who's been referred by a friend of mine and wants advice or whatever, like this is like, these opportunities are fairly rare, right? And you don't want to be in a position where, you know, like you haven't actually seen any of my stuff because, you know, that's not good for you. You're kind of wasting your time because ultimately what that says to me is you're not interested in doing anything specific in my world. You're not into what I'm doing. There's not a collaboration to be done here You just are someone who wants a job. And if you're someone who wants a job, like line up, there's so many people. Right. And so in a way it's sort of like, I I, I have to tell people like the thing to do is simultaneously like value this meeting more, right. Understand that this is a bigger up that, that, that don't be casual about the opportunity of work uh, to, to talk to me. Right which sounds like I'm, I'm putting myself on a pedestal, but at the same time, I'm saying, don't approach me as if I'm like, this is a job interview and you're coming to me hat in hand. Like 
you're a creative person. Like the, the reason I would want to work with you is that you have something, you're bringing something to the table, like that you're, there's a creative collaboration to be done here. This is more like dating. It's more like a marriage than it is like a job interview. And so you come along and it's like, oh, this guy knows the show backwards and forwards. This guy knows exactly what he wants to do. Yeah, he doesn't have a ton of experience, but he has a lot of big ideas. He clearly has the skills. Like he he knows what he wants to do creatively with this show. He's coming in. He understands that it would be a big deal for him to get this job. And at the same time, he can look me squarely in the eye. And I know you could have said this at the time. You could look me squarely in the eye and say, like, you are not going to go wrong hiring me, right? Like, I, there is no way I will let you down, right? And that is so important for anybody. Um, I had a conversation with a young actor, um, and he was asking me for advice. And I was like, okay, so you need to think about parts and things you, know, things you want to do in, in the following way. You should be able to go into an audition and look me in the, look me in the eye and say, there is nobody else in Hollywood who's going to do better at this than I am. I promise. Like, if, if I am, you're not doing me a favor by giving me this role, right? I'd be super excited to get this role. And if you give it to me, you're going to be so glad you did, right? And if you can honestly say that, then you've got a real shot. But if you're coming in in that sort of like, oh, I want to be in Hollywood, like I want to succeed, please give me the job, you're so powerful, like that's not, I don't need that, <laughs> like I can get that anywhere, right? What I need is people with real creative ideas who really know my stuff, who really understand what I'm doing and can present themselves as, as real collaborators. Yeah, I mean, essentially, what you just did is you compress 12 weeks of a class that I teach into a master class of networking in about seven minutes. <laughs> I mean, all of those are gems. I talk about this extensively every single day, all day about how if you're going to reach out to anybody, you have to lead with value first. Yeah. Don't even bother connecting with somebody if you don't know about them personally and you can't write about their work and how it's specifically impacted you. Yeah. If it's, hey, Matt, big fan, um, you know, attach my resume for your reference. I heard you might be looking for a blah, diddy, blah, diddy, blah. Let me know. Oh, and by the way, if you're not looking, could you pass me forward to somebody that is? Delete. Yeah. Done. Right? Like, no thanks. But somebody that takes the time to learn about me or learn about my work, or I know that what I do all day, every day for a living had a positive impact on somebody else, I'll mm -hmm. talk to you. Hell yeah. Why wouldn't I? Because you put in the time. I'm going to put in the time, right? It's this idea of reciprocity. And yeah, there are going to be some people that don't want to do that. You don't want to connect with them anyways. Yeah. But like, you're Matt Nix. Like, you're this big, huge showrunner and you have all this money and all these credit. You would never want to help me, but you're a guy, right? You've got kids. You're a dad. Like, you want to help people out, but they have to be doing it the right way. The other thing I'd say, I mean, I actually, when I talk to film schools and stuff, um, well, I, I do two things that I think you'll like. One is when I'm talking to people, when I'm, I'll talk to classes of directors, right? Aspiring directors. And I'll say, okay, hands up. Who wants to direct television, right? All the hands go up. Great. And I take $20 out of my wallet and I say, here's $20. This $20 goes to the first person in this class, all of you in film school who want to direct television. This $20 goes to the first person in this class who can name a single television director who they do not know personally through family or who isn't the, like, you can't name me because I directed an episode and I'm the showrunner or whatever. You can't name a famous actor. You just need to name like a, a regular television director, a single one who directed the, the, your favorite episode of your favorite show, 20 bucks. I have never given away the $20. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. I do the same thing to writers. I'm like, oh, who wants to write for television? Great. Who wrote your favorite episode of your favorite show, right? That was not written by the showrunner or was not written by a celebrity or somebody whose name, you know, for another reason, 20 bucks, name one, never given away the 20 bucks. Right. And so the point there is I'm like, okay, great. So you guys are gonna, you guys are trying to like network. You're trying to meet people. You're trying to understand the business, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
you don't know the person who wrote or directed your favorite episode of television. Okay. And beyond that, do you know how many fan letter fan, how much fan mail, right? The executive story editor of, you know, burn notice gets for that great episode that they wrote. The answer is zero emails ever, not one ever, right? Your favorite director, you know how much they hear about that great episode that they directed? Never, ever, ever. And I'm like, okay, so who do people reach out to? They reach out to me when they know I am hiring, right? And I'm like, I don't mind. I get it. That's the hustle. I completely understand, right? And I would never criticize anyone for reaching out to me when I'm hiring because of course you would, right? But I'm like, that is the worst time to get me to respond to you because I have a thousand friends when I'm hiring, right? I've got my, my email inbox is always full, right? So, you know, when you could really have gotten a hold of me, anyone, anyone, the day my second show was canceled, right? <laughs> On that day, if you had reached out to me and you were like, hey, I'm a film student in Cleveland at a university with a mediocre film program, but I just wanted to let you know that The Good Guys was my favorite show. And I my, my favorite episode was episode 11, right? And blah, blah, blah. And I just wanted to say, I'm so sorry that I would have talked to you. Like I was bummed, right? That was when, that's the time, right? And so I just find also like, but I guess the thing about that is, reaching out to those people, reaching out at that times, at, at those times, that is authentically reaching out to people whose work you actually like, right? That doesn't, yeah, it, it, it may be that you're building those connections over the course of a couple of years, but you know this, like if you're really trying to break in in Hollywood, you shouldn't be thinking in terms of six months or three months or whatever. You should be thinking in terms of two, three years, right? And so what are the seeds you're planting now, right? Like who are the contacts you're making? What, how, who are you reaching out to, right? Like if you had reached out to me um, on the day my third show Complications was canceled, right? Well, you would have been meeting me like eight months before my next show went on the air, right? If you'd, if you'd reached out when The Gifted got canceled, Turner and Hooch was ramping up nine months later, right? But no one ever, ever, ever does, right? And, you know, it's like, again, I don't mind, but it's, it's, that, it's that thinking long-term and also understanding that, you know, showrunners, people with jobs to give out, they're people too, you know, that they, they have the same you know, they want to know you like their stuff. They want you to, they want to hear that you actually looked at it, all of those things. I know I can't afford you and you're busy, but can you just please come teach my networking class with me? Because I, <laughs> I, I think we, we have a lot of things we agree on and any of my students would be like, oh my God, this is all the crap that Zach teaches us. Maybe he's on to something. I don't yeah. know. But yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement on all of that and then some that it's just all about how do I build an authentic relationship and you got to play a game of chess. Everybody's playing a game of checkers. I just got to make the next move. Oh no, you got to you got to focus on moving the pawn, knowing the checkmate is three years down the road, five yeah. years, ten years down the road, right? And most people just want that next gig, and they don't realize how much more valuable the relationships are if you work on them over time, yes. right? So it's it's just all about that next gig, and there's a whole bunch of other things I would love to unpack in there that uh, probably not going to be able to unpack. There is one very quick aside, maybe a little bit of an anecdote that I wanted to share with you personally because I've always wanted to tell you this story, and I don't think you know it. But you talked about somebody being able to torture the footage. I have built an entire teaching seminar about how I edited the opening of season five's premiere of Burn Notice. Uh -huh. Do you remember the montage? Do you remember we had to put together a montage for the opening of here's kind of the recap of the last six months because oh, that's yeah, where the yeah, show yeah, kind yeah, of made yeah. the transition. Right. Mm -hmm. And people ask me about how you have to reinvent and you have to really, you know, as a, an editor, it's not just here's the material I'm given, but what can I make out of it? The story I always tell people is that we had shot uh, or you had shot uh, the season five premiere Bird Notice and anybody can find it on Netflix if they want to watch it. And everybody felt like, you know what, this is kind of the, the reboot. I'm We're kind of going now, in. Yeah. 
Oh, it's on Hulu. Okay, so I didn't know that. But um, the point being, just about anybody can watch it. But kind of the, the consensus was, we want to open the show bigger than this. We really want to get a sense of like, how has Michael's life changed? And what has he done over the course of the last six months? I'm like, that sounds great. I love it. When are you guys going to shoot it? And you're like, well, we're not shooting anything. We're wondering if you could edit something. I'm like, okay. And then I've, I've actually showed people this. You sent me an email and the entire direction was, here's the paragraph of voiceover. And I looked at it and it was like 90 seconds worth. I'm like, huh. So what am I looking at during this 90 seconds of voiceover? And then, like you said, it was just pillaging and plundering all the old footage and outtakes from four seasons. And at that time, it was literally digging through boxes of DV cam tapes to mm -hmm. digitize the pieces. But the point being that as an editor, it's not just, well, it's paint by numbers and I got my script and I put it together. You have to know the show and you have to be willing to innovate. But I just wanted you to know that I actually take your email and I teach, this is what I was given and here's how you can turn it into something. Because that was one of the most daunting things I've ever taken on in my career. Yeah, but I mean, I, I it's, it's funny because I remember sending, I, I don't remember sending the email, but I remember that, that thing where I was like, you know, you just get this kind of cold fear and you're just like, how are we going to do this? But I would do that kind of thing all the time and just be like, okay, there's, I know that there's something, I know there's something we can find, right? I know there's some way to do this. And I got a sense over time because, you know, Steve Lang was great about that as well. Just like, you know, if we didn't have an out to a scene, he could usually get, like, he could usually manufacture an out to a scene with, uh, our lead actor sort of looking annoyed at someone at some point uh, right right after they'd called cut or right before they'd called action. And it would look like he was sort of thinking and there was like a moment you could push in on that mm -hmm. and that could be the out to a scene. But like, no, it wasn't like officially we didn't shoot it. We just we found it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all of that having been said, I wanted to make sure you, you knew that I literally te that's a teaching moment. That I, I love use. that. Uh, I, think, I think that's so great. It's uh but yeah, the other thing though that I just say with that is that's really important about that is when people are coming up, right? The that feeling of that that I think I I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds when I say this. Like you definitely came in with a uh an attitude of I'm your guy, right? Like there, there was no question in my mind when I sent you notes or whatever, you were not going to tell me that it was unfair because you didn't, we didn't shoot the stuff. You were not going to be like, it's not my job to do this. Thing. Like you were excited by the challenge and you were going, you were up for it. Right. And the, and when I think about like people that kind of come into my life and, you know, are kind of around there's a guy, this, this guy named Kurt, who my assistant knows, right? And he is a, an actor and a producer and stuff like that. And like, whenever I'm doing something, right, that needs actors or people to do stuff, like whatever, like, man, that guy, Kurt, he's always there, right? And he's always got a smile on his face and he's always great. And I didn't notice Kurt for like two, three times, right? But by the seventh time, I was like, man, we got to do something for this Kurt guy. Like he is, he is a baller, man. Like he is always there for whatever, right? And I, I know that I can count on this dude, right? And that is that attitude. I, I tell young writers the, the story of when I hired Ben Watkins onto, who's a showrunner now, but when I hired him onto Burn Notice, uh, he was a baby staff writer. He'd never worked on a show before. You know, he'd written a script that I liked. I had sort of been kind of sold a bill of goods about staff writers, like staff writers, you know, they usually don't write and they're just there to learn and blah, blah, you know, like a, a philosophy that I completely don't believe in anymore. But it was my first show. I didn't know. And I just remember in that first period of time, whenever I said the words, is there somebody who could his hand would go up. He would write my emails. He would write the letter to the network. He would write the notes. Up. He would like that dude was in there all the time. Like 
And, and, and by the way, like anything he did, it came back instantly. It was like, oh, I need that thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. So if you can just have that tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. No, it was done by the end of lunch, right? It was there. And I was like, man, I can count on this guy. Like there's no question, right? And then the season's going along and I'm jammed and like he and and an episode comes in and like, I realized that there's this episode isn't working, but there's this one scene that's good. And I'm like, this scene's good. And it turns out he wrote that scene and I didn't know I was going to write the next episode. And I was like, Ben, can you write the next episode with me? He's like done. Right. And it was a great experience, but that was that feeling of just like can do always there, always enthusiastic, wants to learn want, but like just wants to help like those people. uh, Whenever I meet a new one, I'm like, Oh yeah. Like you're, you're going to make it. There's no question. Well, given the story that we just told about how I was digging through boxes of tapes and doing all this craziness for this montage and having this picture of Ben just throwing his hands up to get anything done possible, it would be very easy to assume that working with you is just like working with anybody else in Hollywood. I have to sell my soul and I have to tell my family, I'll see you in six months because I need to make it in TV. And for a lot of people, that's the way that it works. I don't know if you've been following recently the explosion of this IA Stories Instagram page, and you just hear these horrible, gut-wrenching stories of what people go through just to barely make a living. Not to live the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, but just to barely pay their bills. They're literally selling their souls. So thinking about what I went through on Burn Notice, which is still one of the toughest jobs that I had, but a lot of that was of my own doing because I wanted to show up and make sure that I proved myself. And then you think of Ben or anybody else, you think, oh, it's, it's just just another one of those shows shows where, yeah, you move up, but your talent and your time is exploited. It's exactly the opposite with you. And what's so interesting to me, going back to where we started with this idea of making a decision, you were a brand new showrunner. You had never done it before. You came up as a, a feature writer. And all of a sudden, you're thrust into the world of you know big time cable TV show that ends up being the number one cable TV show. It would have been very easy for you with your lack of experience or your age at that time to just listen to the way that everybody else did it. So I'm curious at what point, whether it was day one, season four, wherever you decided, this is the kind of set and the kind of show I'm gonna run and work-life balance is gonna be important, not just for me, but for everybody, because this is the change that needs to happen in our industry. You know, I can't say that I approached it from the standpoint of wanting to change the industry, because to be honest, I did not know what the, how the industry was. Right. I mean, I literally didn't. I mean, here's here's a good example of that. Um, in the first season, it's, a, it's actually a good example of, of all of those things, all of it put together. Basically, in the first season, there was an episode that came in um, and basically a uh, good writer was not on the same page as the show. Like, you know, so uh, script didn't really work. And when I, I, I it, it clearly didn't work, right? It was clearly, it, it had gone in a direction that was not going to fly. And all of the writers agreed on it, but it was real. it had also been turned in very, very, very late. It was turned in like two weeks late, right? So I basically got the script the day before the first day of prep, right? And I was looking at it in a scouting van and I was like, okay, this is, this, we've got a real problem here. I, I need to rewrite this from scratch. It's like a page one thing. And so um, with regard to that, right, uh, I was talking to my, my assistant at the time and she was like, Matt, you need to understand, like, it is not fair to directors to give them scripts late, right? Because they have to prep. And the Directors Guild is going to fine us if you turn the script in late, right? And so we need to figure something out because this is due before prep on the first day of prep because that is how it has to be, right? And I was like, okay, I guess we got to figure this out. And so I sat down and I started writing and I just wrote for, I'll never forget, it was 52 pages in 16 hours, right? Wow. I just banged it out overnight and I finished it at 9 a.m. the next morning, 
prep started at 10. But in order to get it prepped and in order to get the script in order and everything and all ready to go, I think we ended up turning it in at like 11, right? And I was just like, uh, I called the director and I was like, hey man, I'm just calling to say I have no excuse. I'm very sorry, um, but you know this is what happened and I, there's no excuse for it and you need to do what you need to do with the DGA. I completely get it. And the, the director was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, the script is, it's, you know, the script is laid. And he's like, so wait, so this isn't the script? I was like, no, no, this is the script. And he's like, how was it late? And I was like, well, it was due at 10 a.m. and it came in at 11 a.m. And, and I know that that's, you know, under the guild rules, it's, he was like, he was like, whoa, 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 dude, the last, the last show that I worked on, they turned in the script to me five days late. And I was like, what, <laughs> how did you do it? <laughs> right. And he's like, yeah, 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 no, no, th th this is great. No, I, I love the script. We're, we're in great shape. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. So I guess like all of that is just illustrative of my, I came into it with the following attitude, right? Basically, I'm not going to ask anybody else to do any push-ups I'm not willing to do, right? So if I'm gonna ask you to do push-ups, especially if it's, if it's my show, I'm responsible for the show. Generally speaking, if you're gonna do push-ups, I'll do the push-ups with you, right? Like I need people to know that I'm not asking you to do anything that I won't do. And I'm not asking, I'm not going to waste your time. Like we're doing this for the show right now. The, the other thing is I started the show. I had like my youngest son was born during the pilot, uh, during the shooting of the pilot of burn notice. Right. So I had three little kids at home. Right. So was I willing to stay up all night and do a script if I really needed to? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, I, there were other young families on the show and stuff like that. And I was basically like, well, I'm not going to not see my children. And if this is, if, if not seeing children is a push up that I'm not willing to do, I'm not asking anybody else to do it. Right. And so that was also my attitude about fratter days or, or things like that on set. It was like, yeah, occasionally like a really, really late night, for burn notice was one or two in the morning on a Friday, right? Um, we tried to not go past 12, you know, we would go sometimes into, you know, but we like, I want to say we did the classic dawn on Saturday thing, maybe once in, I mean, it, that was like a hurricane hit, you know what I mean? And, and I guess like my attitude about all of that is just like, my family is a priority to me and I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. And I would say a corollary to that is, you know, just to be, to put my cards on the table, right. It is also important to me to know that someone is willing to bang it out when it's really necessary, you know, because like, I will never ask you to do it if it's not really necessary. Right. But I guess my, here's the best way to put it. Uh, and I talked to the showrunner training program about that, about this idea. In Hollywood, you are either a patriot or you are a mercenary, right? I only like to work with patriots. I like working with people who are there because they believe in the thing that we are doing, right? Now, patriots are, there are great mercenaries out there who do great work for pay, right? And that's fine. Like I have no, and I've worked with great mercenaries before and I don't have a problem with a great mercenary, but fundamentally, like I want to be in a show with a group of people that really believes in the show that are doing where everybody's doing it because they believe in the show. And those people are the people that you want with you when the chips are down, when you're in the foxhole, et cetera, you can't, and you can ask them to go further than the mercenaries right? Like they will, they will battle to the last man when it really matters. They will do the job when it really matters, but you don't get to ask them. You don't, you don't, you don't get to change the terms, right? 
basically, if you're doing it for love, if I'm calling you my brother, I better treat you like my brother. Does that make sense? Like, I don't get to, I don't get to be like, you're my brother. Oh, actually now I'm paying you and you're doing this for money. Okay. Now you're my brother again. Like you don't get to do that. Right. And so my feeling in general is you get to do one or the other. Either you say to people, yep, yeah, this is one of those shows where you're selling your soul and blah, blah, blah. And, and you're going to do whatever I say, I'm going to pay you a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. And if that's the case, people should know that up front. Like, I don't like those jobs. I don't like working that way. But, you know, if you know that up front, I guess, I don't know, like that's their business. I don't like running my business that way. So you're not going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why the can't all the other shows be like that? Well, I mean, to be honest, though, I think that um, there are a lot of a show generally like reflects the circumstances of its creator. You know what I mean? Like what happens a lot is just your psychology gets kind of put out there in a big way. Right. And it suffuses the, the room and the, you know, so, I mean, actually one thing I will say is in my mid thirties, when I was doing burn notice and stuff, one thing that I did then that was very much part of my psyche that I wouldn't do now, right. That I'm a little, self-conscious about, right, is I had a sort of fratish mindset, right? There was like a, I was more likely, you know, and, and so like burn, for better and for worse, burn notice definitely like the writer's room, the working conditions on that, like, you know, um, it led to doing things that I wouldn't do now, like, oh, I don't know, um, challenging the writer's assistants to, you know, like, uh, let's see who can run around the block fast enough. And then, you know, the fastest and blah, blah, blah. Like, and then we would do that with the writers and stuff like that, you know, and, and like, I like that kind of thing, but not everybody likes that kind of thing, but that was definitely part of my psyche at the time. And that manifested itself in, you know, like, uh, it, like let's all go out for drinks or, you know, things like that. Right. Which maybe, maybe you wouldn't do now. Um, but the, I think one of the things is a lot of showrunners um, are, they're kind of mercenary themselves. Do you know what I mean? They're kind of like, they don't necessarily like what they're writing or they, they didn't come to it because there was something that they really wanted to do or whatever. So that, that kind of resentment or that weariness or that anger or whatever it is that comes through, you know? And then the other thing is, I think, you know, I, I, when I talk to people about actors, I'm like, being an actor is an incredibly hard job. You have to put up with all of this, like rejection and uncertainty. And what will get you through? Well, one thing that will get you through is being really committed to your craft and showing up for all your auditions and being like, this is another opportunity to act. And I'm grateful for any opportunity to act. And this audition is just what it is. And I'm just going to do this. I'm going to be here now. And I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to enjoy wherever I am at any time. That will get you through. Another thing that will get you through as an actor is having a screaming, howling demon chasing you all of the time, threatening to eat your soul if you ever slow down, right? That will also keep you going, right? And so... Um, and the second one is pretty common in Hollywood. There's a lot of actors being chased by howling demons, right? There are also a lot of writers and showrunners who are being chased by howling demons. What gets you through writing? What, like what, what helps you with the blank page? What makes you able to write when there's nothing there, right? Well, one thing that can do it is, you know, if you're like me, it's like, well, I've got to do my homework and everyone's expecting this. And also it would be really cool if I did this. And, you know, like I've got all of this, I've got that psyche, but there are a lot of people who are like, you know, I have to write to prove everyone wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And that'll get you through, you know, that'll, that'll, you'll write a show and maybe you'll become a showrunner, Right. But that, that thing inside of you if you came from that place, it's going to manifest itself in the show. 
Have you ever heard the William Faulkner quote that I only write when creative inspiration strikes and it happens to strike at 9 a.m. every morning? Yes, I actually You strike just, me as that type. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that quote is that's quoted in uh, The War of Art, uh, the uh, the Stephen Pressfield book, um, which I highly recommend for for all aspiring creatives. So speaking of aspiring creatives, let's talk about aspiring writers showrunners, producers, show creators that want to, you know, have the, the kind of resume that you do someday. Going back to the beginning where we talked about my unlikely story, somebody looks at my IMDb page and they did this many times after I'd gotten the job on burn notice, I'd been asked to speak on a couple of panels. The most frequent question I got was, uh, I saw your, your resume of your credits. I don't understand how you got the job on burn notice because it's a total scattershot mess where it's just tiny indie film trailer, tiny indie film, Boom, number one show on cable, makes no sense. I gotta be honest, when I go through and I do the anatomy of your path and process, kind of the same thing on IMDb. Like, mm -hmm. so little tiny short, little tiny short, and then all of a sudden, showrunner creator, burn notice. And I know that not everything is reflected on IMDb, but let's talk about how you were able to break in for those that really wanna become the next Matt Nix or they wanna be their own version of a showrunner creator. What does that look like? Um. It is interesting, actually, a lot of people, I mean, over the years, people definitely like the idea that my story is a story of someone who'd literally done my IMDb story, which is like, he had done essentially nothing. And then he went to burn notice right away. Basically, the reality is that starting when I was 24, basically, I started writing full time. And I was writing features and for some years I was writing like uh, kind of indie features for uh, non-union production companies. And then I got um, that I'd, I'd written one thing that got some attention and that got me into the world of like studio rewrites and pitches and things like that. And so I'd been doing that from, I want to say for when Burn Notice started, I've been doing that consistently for about six years. And the thing about it was like, I, I had a young family, right? And my thing was, I never, ever, ever stopped looking for work. I would pitch on everything, right? I was writing constantly. There were times when I would get a job and the day after I got a job, I'd be pitching on another job because I was always trying to line up a bunch of things. And my batting average was not that high. Like I would, you know, basically my, what I, I used to say to my wife is if I have five sure things, I will get one of them because three of them will turn out to be not a real thing. It'll go away somehow. One of them, I will definitely be getting the job and then the job will go to someone else. And then the last one I will get. Right. And so I think I, one time I looked at my hard drive and I, I want to say like in those years, I think I, and I would work out every movie soup to nuts, kind of like what you're talking about with like watching all the episodes of Burn Notice. If I went in and I was doing a little pitch on a movie, I would, I would have broken the entire movie. I would know everything that was going to happen in the movie. And then I would go in and I'd reduce it and pretend that I didn't know everything and just be like, yeah, it's something like this and blah, blah, blah. You know, I pitched the whole thing. I also read books on sales you know what I mean? Like I was like, I was all in. Right. And I mean, I remember the meeting I, when I talked to you about like the being able to look at someone and be like, you can hire me for this or not, but I promise you, I will not let you down. I know what I'm doing. I am doing you a favor. If you buy this thing from me, I can remember the day, the instant I got that. Right. I was in a pitch and that's when it turned a corner, but it was like years in. Right. I was like, I'd been pitching, I'd done all of these things. And I think, yeah, I, I want to say I worked out like 70 movies, right? So I was constantly working. I was constantly uh, selling things and nothing was getting made, but I was making a decent living, right? Just doing things because I would be the guy that you'd hire for your like permanent development project. You needed someone cheap, like, and I would come along and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I've got it. And they'd be like, well, no one's thought about this more than this dude. Okay, sure you can rewrite this thing that we've rewritten seven times that's sitting on the back burner at Sony. Got it. Right. And so, and then the other thing is the name of the game in that is 
just hanging on to the movie as long as you can, right? Staying. So I would do the extra rewrite. I would do that. Now there's a whole exploitability thing there. You know what I mean? Like a lot of writers get exploited for free work and I did too. But at the same time, my attitude was like, there's no one who's going to work harder than I am, right? Like knock yourself out, find whoever, but I'm going to be faster. I'm going to be, I'm going to turn it around quicker. I'm going to take the punch in the mouth where you say like, well, we were, I have to say we were a little disappointed by this, this draft. Right. And then, you know, I'd be dying inside, but I'd be like, it's the the quote from Ed Wood. Well, my next one will be much better. Right. Mm. Like just, I would back in all the time. So by the time I came to television, I had this work ethic and I was fast. Right. And I also kind of had this other thing that I was doing. So I was like, okay, sure. Uh, you know, you want, uh, how long is this thing? It's like 60 pages. Sure. No problem. Right. And so, uh, I came in and I did that. And then I basically, a big part of how I got burn notice was like, I went in and I pitched it. They wanted to pass. Right. In fact, they passed as I left, the president of the network was like, yeah, I don't think that's for us. It's too dark. Right. But there was a young executive who's now a very senior executive who was like, no, no, I think we should do this one. I think we can figure it out. And he was like, all right, Skippy, <laughs> you get one. Right. And so that became the thing. And so I wrote it. They thought it was too dark. I rewrote it. They thought it was better, but still too dark. I rewrote it. They ended up hiring me for an extra rewrite because every time they asked me to do notes, I would hand them a brand new script. I wouldn't just go through and tweak it at the margins. I'd be like, they didn't like it. I'll do a whole new thing. Right. I'll write you didn't like the A story. You've got some notes on the A story. I got a better idea. How about a totally new A story with totally different characters, right? And so at a certain point, they were like, man, if we give this guy notes, he's just going to run with them. He's just going to do a totally new thing. And that led them to hire me for one extra draft, which is never, never happens in television. They did that. They liked that draft. And that's what they greenlit. Now, off of the other thing is, for all of those years that I've been writing features, I was typically making one or two short films a year just for myself, just to put out there in the world, just because I like directing and I like producing and I wanted to make stuff. And like, I'm also just that guy, like at Thanksgiving with my kids, like I made an episode of the Action Boys series every year for seven years, right? We've got seven, and these are like, major productions, right? That take <laughs> all of Thanksgiving. So when I stop working, when I stop writing and directing professionally to take a vacation, I write and direct on an amateur basis with my children and their cousins making superhero movies about children, right? So like that was that. And it turned out when I got into, when they they picked up Burn Notice for, to pilot and I got into it, I had... I had a lot of reps under my belt of just producing my own stuff. So all of the things that a showrunner needs to do, like write for budget, nothing teaches you to write for budget, like paying your own money for something. You're like, I don't know that we need this location because I would prefer to, to have $3,000 than spend it on this. Right. And so I had, I had a lot of reps under my belt with that. I understood production pretty well and I was able to do that. And then the other thing was I had run a writer's group for, man, like seven years or something. And where it was like working with writers, giving notes on scripts, stuff like that, which I just, again, I just did for fun and to have a community of writers around me and stuff like that. And that turned out to be great practice for the writer's room because the first day of the writer's room, I'd never been in a writer's room. I was like, uh, I don't know who, who writes on the board. So that's usually the writer's assistant's job. I was like, oh, I'll do it, right? So I, I wrote on the board. Like, I didn't know that writer, I didn't, for years, actually, I didn't know that showrunners left the room and let people break story when they weren't there. So I was like, oh, no, uh, I got to be there the whole time, right? So, you know, I just kind of made it up as I went along. But I had a lot of experience coming in that just happened to be relevant to being a showrunner. And, but a lot of it was just like, because, you know, like I was enthusiastic, I was there. And, and the other thing is like, to this day, man, like no joke, I want to write everything. Like 
You think I'm joking. I want to write 100% of the projects in Hollywood, maybe except for the slasher films. But even there, even as I say it, I'm like, I don't know, man, maybe I could do a slasher film. That sounds interesting, right? And so, like, I... I'm just hungry for it. I love to do it, right? I mean, it's a pain in the ass sometimes, but like, I love to do it. And so that like, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote an episode, you can see it on my IMDb page. I wrote an episode of Ben 10, the cartoon show because my kids were watching it and I happened to know the creator and I was at a party once and I was like, can I write an episode of Ben 10? I really want to write an episode of Ben 10. And she was like, uh, sure. And so I wrote an episode of Ben 10. Great experience, but I was like, just as nerd like this was after i'd been a showrunner for 10 years like i was like just as nervous when i turned it in i think i made like three thousand dollars i was like but i was like oh yes i created the father of dr animo in ben 10 the cartoon series i'm still proud of that right and so that that was the other thing just like in general i felt really lucky to have the opportunity i wanted it really bad and I was excited to do it. There's a whole lot that I could unpack from that. And I know that we uh, we're getting very close to being uh, to time. And I know that you have other obligations that we've discussed off the record that you might need to take care of, but there's no, one actually, I think, I think my wife took the chicken out of the oven. So I'm fine. Oh, did she? Okay, good. And I'm going to make sure we keep that in there. I'm not editing that part out. Um, but the one thing I want to point out that I think is so important about the story that you told as it relates to everything that's going on politically in our industry and all the things that I've talked about for years, the word exploitation. And I want to rephrase one of those things and I want to give you my perspective and you can tell me that I'm totally wrong or I'm totally right. Okay. I don't believe that people get exploited. I believe that people allow themselves to be exploited. And I think in your case, somebody could look from the outside and say, well, you are writing for free and doing extra drafts and like you just got taken advantage of, but you clearly didn't because you saw the value in the work that you were doing and you knew willingly, they might not be paying me for this, but it's allowing me to get better at my craft. It's putting myself out there. And it was those extra drafts that went from, yeah, that doesn't sound like it's a good fit to, eh, screw it. Let's shoot it. Let's just shoot the pilot and see what we got, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that you were ever exploited you were allowing yourself to be exploited, knowing that there was enough value that it was a reciprocal transaction. But I think that there are so many people that just accept that I need, I need to be exploited because that's part of the industry. I have to pay my dues. So I have to go through hell for 10 years or more and sacrifice family and sanity and everything else because that's just the way that it is in Hollywood. And what I'm trying to help people do is learn to use the word no. If you're not getting it reciprocal value and value is not money, sometimes it is, but I'm sure that you've heard this before as a writer and I hear it all the time on the editing side of things, you should never take free work. And I'm like, yeah, you should. You should take free work all the time as long as you're respected and you're getting value out of it. But there's always this binary note. Nope, you got to make sure you're getting paid your full rate. If that's the way that you look at it, you're never going to end up doing what you want to do because you have to make those sacrifices, but you can never allow yourself to be exploited unless the value is there. I would say, yeah, I would, the only caveat I'd say is I don't think it's exploitation. I have a, a you know, Craig Siebels. Um, sure. Yeah. So Craig worked on burn notice and stuff and, and he, he has a philosophy that I think you'll like, which is he has two rates. He has full rate and free. There is no rate in between full rate and free, right? And his philosophy is I am being paid either in money, in which case I expect my full rate, right? Or because that is what I am worth, or I am being paid in relationship and, and I am building a relationship and an ongoing something with a collaborator, right? And so, and he's like, if somebody's like, well, I can give you $400. He's like, I do not. The only thing he will accept is expenses, right? Basically like if, yeah, it's like the gas money or whatever, but that's all because his thing is he doesn't want you thinking that because, you know, his card rate for the day is a thousand dollars or $2,000 or, I mean, now he's a producing director, so it's a totally different thing. But like back when he was a production designer, right? If his day rate was a thousand dollars, he didn't want you giving him three hundred dollars and thinking that like you're good now, right? Like you know, basically that is exploitation, right? Exploitation is giving someone 
who makes a thousand dollars a day, three hundred dollars a day, and being like, "Catch you later, bud. There's your three hundred bucks. You got it, right?" Um, and so, the thing that he looks at when he takes a project is, like, and and by the way, sometimes it's not going to work out, right? But if he takes a project and he works for free, he's like, "Okay." is this someone I believe in, right? Is this someone with whom I actually want an ongoing relationship so much that I'm willing to do my best work for this person, right? And if that is the case, he's like, yep, I'll do it, right? Like, and, and he still does free work to this day, right? And we got together, like he was the production designer on all my short films, he would show up to do kids films with me and just be like, Hey, we're doing, I'm doing this thing for charity. I'm making this film or whatever. And he'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm there. Right. And he never took a dime. Right now on the other side of it, he knew that I understood the nature of this relationship. He knew that he could trust me is essentially the thing. Right. And so I think that for people who are in that position, you've got to look at it and go, hey, do you like trust your instincts and be like, okay, is this someone who I actually trust, right? Is this someone who I actually believe has my back, you know, will, will, you know, that we really do have an ongoing relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you'll be wrong, right? But that's just the price of doing business, right? You, you don't need to be right 100% of the time. You need to be right like 60% of the time. And those gigs are worth doing, right? But if you do a free job for someone who you know in your heart of hearts doesn't really know your name or care who you are or you know whatever right then like that's a then you are allowing yourself to be exploited now i would also say on the other side of it um or, or you know like within that there are times when i'm like okay you're going to work on this thing and what i'm paying you in is titles right you're someone who would normally um, you know, be like a costume assistant. And here's a thing where I'm going to give you the title costume designer, and I'm going to give you a real opportunity to do a great job as a costume designer. And it's, you're going to be able to show it off and it'll be good for you. Right. And I try to be upfront. Like I don't say in so many words, I'm not hiring you as the costume designer on my next series. Right. But I'm going to look at people and go like, no, I'm not bringing this person on because I would be just exploiting them. But this young person is like young and hungry and blah, blah, blah. And like, this is a big opportunity for them. And I will sing their praises and I will promote their cause. And I can't hire them as the costume designer on my next series, but maybe there's an opportunity for them in the costume department on my next series. And that would be a big thing for them. And so I just think that's like, that's kind of the way you, you need to look at it. Um, and you need to just take a, a hard look and go, I'm being paid in something, right? And sometimes that something is a great experience. Sometimes that something is, you know, I, I, I know people where I was like, there was an actor that I worked with um, who was on Burn Notice and he, he was on The Good Guys and he's, he's done other things. Um, but like, I was like, I'm doing a charity thing, right? Uh, it's for this school. I need an actor. I need five full days of your time. I will pay you in wine and it will be a blast. I promise. And he was like, totally in. He was awesome. He was great with the kids. And, you know, as it turned out, not long thereafter, I was like, say, I need an actor for this television program I'm doing. Uh, would you be available to come to Texas and be in this show? And he was like, why, yes, I would. And it worked out very nicely. Which again goes back to that whole conversation about chess versus checkers, right? Yeah, um, and just and I love love this philosophy of I'm either full rate or free so much. So I'm going to very briefly share my own version of that just to show Please. once again how in alignment we are. Um, I will fight tooth and nail. Ask anybody at any of the studios when it comes to negotiation time. Man, am I difficult because I refuse to let somebody else set my value. I set my value. I've worked very hard to do what I do. And I am, like you said, I'm firmly confident you hire me. Not only does the job get done, not only do I do your notes, I do your notes, but better. 
Mm-hmm. And you're somebody that can attest to that. I don't say, well, I did everything you said. I'm like, half your notes were stupid and I made it better in spite mm-hmm. of the notes, right? And I can proudly say that and confidently say, I believe this is better. I gave it everything that I had. That has tremendous value to the people that have money. Then at the same time, when other people come to me, like the perfect example, um, through the journey of becoming an American Ninja Warrior over the last four years, I've developed a lot of relationships with athletes that know nothing about filmmaking and editing. So I've kind of become like, oh, it's that ninja guy that works on the Cobra Kai show. So uh, one of the stars of the show, uh, her name is Jessie Graff. She's like the, the female face of the sport. She just sends me an email one day. Hey, I heard you were you know in editing stuff. I have this YouTube series. You want to take a look at it. It inspired the out of me. It was like about this eight-year-old kid and building her backyard obstacle course and she wants to be a ninja. I'm like, I'd be happy to help you with this, whatever you need. Great. I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm like, oh, no, 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 you're not paying me for it. Like, if you want to invite me over to do some rock climbing or something, that'd be yeah. great, but I'm not going to allow you to pay me because yeah. I knew the value was number one, I could have a positive impact in the world with this piece. Number two, great relationship to build that I can use to enhance my skills, right? But it wasn't about the money. I wasn't gonna let somebody that was struggling to put this together pay me money, mm-hmm. right? She's like, well, you must be really expensive. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got a pretty high rate, but there's no reason that I see charging you money for it because you're never gonna even come close to what the rate is. So how about we, we make it zero instead? She just kind of looked at me, she's like, okay. And then just last week, I had a conversation uh, with my ninja trainer, Tony Horton, uh, the guy that created the P90X series, been training with him every Sunday for years. And he does these events where he brings people to his home and like it's a personal development experience and they do all kinds of obstacle stuff, like people that really aren't in shape to be doing it. It's kind of their first introduction to all these crazy fears of climbing ropes and stuff like that. And I've volunteered for him in the past and he started paying me for it, like just very little minimal amounts. And I said, listen, instead of you paying me in a check, and uh, the money that you're going to pay me for the next one, can I just have a backpack instead? Because mm-hmm. it would really mean a lot to me to have a branded backpack from your event. And he's like, yeah, but I'll pay you. I'm like, you know, I'm like I would much rather have the backpack. Yeah. I don't need the money, but the backpack means the world to me. And again, he's like, all right, dude, you can have a backpack. It's fine. <laughs> right. But to me, it's I set my value. I don't allow somebody else to set my value. And I think that's one of the reasons this has become such an exploitative culture. Number one, people want to exploit other people because they're selfish and they don't they have a complete disregard for work life balance or anything else. But I think the bigger problem, frankly, is so many people just say yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's true. And I think it's it's uh yeah. Like it can happen to all of us, you know, and it's ultimately if you're not willing to draw the line, then you know, nobody else is going to draw it for you. And, and, you know, you can't, and the other thing is like, I, there are definitely times, like, I feel like I have a pretty good attitude about it with people, but I'm also like, I got a lot of folks around. I got a lot of things that are going on, right? I'm not necessarily going to know if someone Like I might ask someone to do something having no idea how long it's going to take. Right. And they might end up feeling exploited because like I asked them to do something impossible, you know, in, I mean, this is to take a ridiculous example. Like I asked somebody to make these costumes. I have no idea how long that takes. I have no idea. Right. So they might end up feeling exploited because they never said, no, this is blah, blah, blah. We can't do this or whatever. Right. But I I would say also the other thing is what you're saying goes hand in hand. And it's super important for people to understand this. Like in the entertainment industry, you can't do what you're talking about without like an equal amount of passion and commitment. Right. Because if you if you're coming at it like a mercenary where you're basically like, yeah, okay. You know, I'm not that into your project, but you know, I need the job and blah, blah, blah. And I'll do this thing. Um, and yeah, sure. And then like someone offers them the, the regular day rate and they're like, no, I know my worth. It's this, you know, like, okay, get ready to never get a job. Right. That's never happening because like you can do what you're talking about, if you've done all of the things that we've talked about over the course of this discussion, if it's like, okay, the guy that 
knows my show backwards and forwards, that is looking me in the eye and saying, I'm going to work my butt off for your show. I'm going to kick all kinds. Of it's going to be great. You're going to be super happy. And to make my life work, I need this, right? That is like, then at least I have a, there's something that, there's something for me to consider there, right? I'm like, okay, like I can either pay this or I can't pay this or whatever, but like, I, I understand the value proposition, right? And I do see people, uh, it happens a lot with actors where they're just like, um, you know, I actually just went through this with some actors where it's like, you know, you're negotiating, right? And they just want more money, right? But you don't have any sense for like whether they even give about your project, right? And so at a certain point, it's like, okay, so we're just your ATM and you're just going to walk away if blah, blah, blah. Like, and what is this even based on? It's just like, yeah, all right. So we got a big network show and you're just like, okay, you see an opportunity for a payday and blah, blah, blah. And like, this is not the relationship that I want with an actor, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're just doing this for an enormous amount of money and that's the only thing you care about, and you can't even be bothered to communicate in any way about why you care about this. When it comes down to it, I'm like, yeah, no, let them walk. I don't care. Right. Like I don't, I don't want this. And that, so you get my point. It's like, you got to do both at the same time. Yeah. Ultimately it's, if you're going to want to ask for more money or more time or whatever it is, I always tell people don't bring a new problem to somebody, bring a solution. Yeah. If I if I want X number of dollars more, here's why you're going to make double that in return. Because when you pay me X number of dollars, I'm going to bring X, Y, and Z to the table. Yeah. Here's why that's going to make a difference for you, make your life easier and make you more money. Then people listen because there's the value proposition versus no, I want more. Like you, you, you can't, you can't argue with that. You can't negotiate with that. Right. But as long as there's value associated with it and you're confident, like you said, I know I can get the job done. This is what it's going to cost, but here's why that's a bargain. Right. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I tell people is that you, you're basically creating the value proposition that you're saying to them, it's going to cost you more money not to give me this than it is to give me this. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, all right. Now, now that makes sense. Now we can talk. I'd also say people should remember that even when, when people are talking to me about stuff like that, when, you know, because like, they're sort of like, oh yeah, he's the one that gives the job. They have to remember, I'm not writing the checks, right? So I have to turn around and pitch this to someone else. I have to make a case, right? So if someone comes to me and says just, I want more money, right? What I'm going to turn around in the best case, I'm going to turn around and say some version of this to the studio. This person really wants more money. Um, I know that it's legit. I know that it's lame and I, and I have no idea why they like, I, there's, there seems to be no basis for them wanting this money other than they would just like more money. Like all of us would. However, it is the, the value proposition that I put to them in the best case is I do not have time to deal with this, right? Please give them this money so that I do not have to deal with finding <laughs> someone else right now because it is too difficult for me to do that right now. And I will be honest with you, that conversation usually ends with, we will handle this at the end of the season. Thank you very much, right? Like this person, yeah, this person has put the screws to me and they have done it successfully. Congratulations, you just changed the basis of this relationship. You just converted yourself from a, a mercenary, from a patriot into a mercenary. I now know that you, I now know what you care about, right? And now that's the basis that we're going to be moving forward on, right? And so, okay, but like that for me, like I hate those conversations. But if someone comes to me and basically says, here's the situation, here's why I need this, here's why it's good for you, here's how it's going to work for you. I may have to say to them like, okay, I get that. This is, I got to tweak your conversation in the following two ways, or here's why that number is not quite going to work, but this number might, right? And then, then we can have a conversation. Then I can turn around to the studio and say, hey, give them this money for the following reasons. It's going to work for me and it's going to work for them. And it's yeah. going to work for you. 
So when I start my negotiating class, you're also going to be teaching that. So <laughs> make sure to open up your calendar for both the networking class and the negotiating class. Um, none of it, this is a surprise, the amount of knowledge bombs you were dropping. Um, but I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm going to be very, very um, excited to share this with everybody. But I have one more question that I can let you go. Great. What I want you to do, and this is a, a fairly new experiment that I've been doing on the show that's yielded some some pretty awesome stories. You can do it in 30 seconds, 10 minutes, whatever is going to make the most sense for you. But we're going to jump in a time machine. And I want you to, to imagine the moment, and I don't know exactly where it is in the trajectory of your career, but it's probably early on when you were doing some of these, you know, rewrites of rewrites of films you knew that never going to get it made, whatever it might have been, kind of the lowest point where you're wondering, is this ever, ever going to happen? Or am I just going to be stuck in rewrite on movies that never, are? and nobody's ever going to see, whatever moment that kind of is for you in your mind. Time travel back to that person, knowing what you know now, what do you tell him? What's your advice? Oh. Um, it's easier to answer that with a story. Um, it was about the script that, so I can say the advice, but the advice will be clear in the story. Um, basically, years ago, uh, like when early, early in my career, I was approached to write a, um, a script, an adaptation of a British literary novel. And I was doing it for free, but like the value proposition was actually good for me at the time. I was like, okay, so it's this producer that I want a relationship with. And it's this director who, you know, is like, a you know, he's a I later realized he was less of a big deal than I thought he was. But at the time I was like, okay, he's a pretty big deal. And I, I, so I did this adaptation and I finished it and I was so excited. Like it turned out so well. It was like everything I wanted it to be. I remember just like finishing it at two in the morning and just being like, oh my God, oh, this is it. This is like, this is exactly what I want. Oh, this is fantastic. So excited. Right. I turned it in um, and, you know, I showed it to some people. They were like, this is great, right? Oh my God, this is fantastic, right? Turned it in. The director basically was like, yeah, it needs a lot of work. It's like, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, just, I don't really like it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I might need to take a pass at this myself. Well, you know, like, it's just, you know. And the producer was like, Basically, yeah, the director doesn't like it. I, you know, kind of, he wants to kind of go his own way with it. I, you know, we really need to get this made and well, you know, so, and I was like, wow, okay, right. And that was, I was like, it felt like some of the best work I'd ever done. I was super excited about it. And basically like, it just landed with a thud, right? The director didn't like it. The producer, you know, was like kind of, all right, you know, a year later, um, I was doing a charity thing, right, with the producer. Um, and we went out to lunch after, and he um, said to me at the lunch, like, hey, do you, do you still have a copy of that script? The, you know, the one that you wrote, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, you're the producer. You don't have a copy? And he's like, ah, no, I, just, I, I misplaced it or whatever. And I was like, well, sure. You know, like, dead. And I went home, and uh, I found it, and I emailed it over to him. Right. And I was like, um, there it is. He called me a few days later and he said, man, I don't know what you did in your rewrite to this, but this script is amazing. Right. Can I get you an agent? Cause I think I can get you an agent off this. Like, do you want to, cause he was, he had started being a manager at the time. And I was like, sure. I had not touched it in a year. Right. And he sent it to an agent and I basically had an agent two days later who was like, I love this script. We can do all kinds of, you know, basically. So I went in with the script that everybody hated. Right. Except like my family, you know what I mean? Like people that I knew personally. Right. And then they, uh, you know, signed with this agent who was like, great. She started sending me out for meetings. Right. And I went into a meeting at Warner Brothers, 
right? Where they were like, we love this script, but we read another script that is very similar, right? It's the blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, who's it by? Well, it turned out, you know, that director that didn't like the script, he had done a light pass on it, taken my name off the script and gotten a three picture deal at Warner Brothers off of my script. Now, none of those pictures ever actually happened, right? But, um, and fortunately he hadn't sent it around much because the deal went, you know, so quickly that the deal came up so quickly at Warner Brothers. And so that was, that launched my career. That, that was the script that got me my first jobs, the whole thing, right? So if I were to hop in that time machine, right, and go back in time, I would just say, you know what your best work is. You know when you've nailed it, right? And basically the world is not necessarily going to agree with you when that happens, right? It is not necessarily going to happen. I'm sure you sent the Bannon way to other people before me who were like, yeah, no, it's cool. It's just, you know, kind of not really, you know, whatever. But if you are true of heart, right, and you do the things that you want to do and you put your all into them and you keep putting it out there, because the, the other thing is like <clears throat> that producer, when he asked me, hey, do you have the, the script? I could have been like, F that guy. You know what I mean? Like, he didn't like it a year ago. And I was like, no, it's, it's cool, whatever. You know what I mean? And there you go. And, and I guess like the, the upshot and I actually, even a, I'll fast forward to years later, I ran into that director again, right. Who actually was very nice to me and tried to ar help arrange an opportunity for me. Now, did he feel guilty? Maybe. Did he remember the story differently? Also possible. I have no idea. But at that moment, I could also have been like, F that guy, right? But I was just like, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not gonna trust him with a script, but it doesn't, you know, like ultimately I don't need enemies, right? And so, yeah, basically the upshot of the story is I would go back in time and be like, just do your work, put it out there, keep smiling. And, and if it doesn't work now, trust that it will work at some point in the future. Amazing, amazing advice that anybody listening that's trying to break in, level up, make a transition, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, I would say that that's very applicable advice no matter what. Uh, and I do have to say, I'm gonna give myself a gold star and I'm gonna tell you that I had a goal. And I don't know if you know what the goal was, but I got a very nice, pleasant message from your assistant. And your assistant said, I noticed that on your scheduler that you do 90 minutes, but can we get it down to 60? I'm like, absolutely no problem. I want to be totally respectful of Matt's time, but I wanted this to be engaging enough that we made it all the way to 90 minutes and we're here. There you did. So, you made it to 90 minutes. And I know how valuable your time and your expertise are. So the fact you were like, uh, dude, like, really? Come on, like it's been 58 <laughs> minutes. So um, I seriously, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate connecting today, um, how much of an impact you've had on my career and just my life in general and my viewpoint of how to be successful the right way. Um, it means a lot to me. And I know that we've had some hits and misses as far as like being able to work together again and scheduling conflicts and whatnot. Another which we've just run into, which kind of breaks my heart. But um, that being the we're case- We're literally never available, dude. You are never, ever available. Well, I've got two words for you, Cobra and Kai. Yeah, it's, I get it. It's I get kind it. of yeah. taken over my entire life. Yeah, there you um, go. So, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's one of those shows where like Burn Notice was at the time. I watched it and like, and I did the exact same thing to Cobra Kai that I did to you. I saw season one and like, oh, I'm editing this show. <laughs> like there, there is no question. And I watched the whole thing twice. It was a lot easier with 10, 30 uh, minute episodes than it was with yeah, like yeah, 47, yeah, yeah. 42 minute episodes. But I just basically walked into that interview. I'm like, your show is going to be better with me editing. It, and here's why. And they're like, who is this guy? <laughs> right. Three seasons later, here we are. And I've told that story too, but it was the exact same approach. The difference was I had years and years of credit. So it was a little bit of an easier sell. Right. Same thing. I was just like, I must edit this show. <laughs> so, um, but on that note, Someday. can't thank, yes. Uh, can't thank you enough. This has been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, 
you know, just uh, really appreciate everything that you've done uh, for both in my life and in the lives of others. And by the way, um, I talked to my mom right before I started this call and she's like, oh, make sure to tell Matt that I say hi and I miss his parties. Oh, fantastic. Yes, she's, uh, <laughs> she's one of your biggest fans. Yes, well, so. tell her that all her son needs to do is work on one of my shows again, and uh, she's 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 back at my house. Yes, we are indeed going to make that happen because I miss your parties. Awesome, sounds great. So, uh, well, thank you so much. I can't uh, can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to me. Thanks a lot.